Hey viewers, if you're watching this video, you're likely at least mildly interested in either 3D printing, plastic injection machine, or just making parts at home that you can then sell online. We've already addressed this topic where we made our own Legos at home, and that video was quite a success, so today we're hoping to address some of the most common questions we received, specifically about what type of 3D printer can you use to make the molds that we then plastic inject into using Injecto, our desktop plastic injection machine. There are two categories of polymers that we should first become familiar with. The first one is a thermoset polymer, the second is a thermoplastic polymer. Thermoplastic polymers are very common plastics like those used for making milk jugs, or perhaps you've heard of ABS and PLA if you're familiar with 3D printers. Thermoplastic polymers are usually the ones that you can heat up to plasticize them or melt them, and then once they cool, they just harden, and that's how you shape them. This is the principle behind the first type of 3D printer available on the market. These are our conventional FDM printers. They just take plastic filament, they heat it up, they extrude it, and once it cools down, it solidifies. The issue with these printers, as it relates to plastic injection molding, is that when you heat them up, the plastic becomes soft, and you can't have a mold that becomes soft when you heat it up, especially when you're trying to inject plastics that have the same melting temperature as the mold itself. So to answer the most common question we get, no, you cannot use FDM printers to make molds to then use with our Injecto desktop plastic injection machine. Alternatively, we have resin printers. Resin printers print our second category of plastics, which are thermoset polymers. These usually don't melt. They undergo a chemical reaction when you add heat to them that makes them solidify. This reaction is not really reversible. Think of epoxy as a great example. You have part A, you have part B. When you mix the two, they heat up a lot. This causes the chemical change within the polymer, which sets it, and that's it. You can't reheat epoxy, turn it back into two liquids, and then reuse it. Doesn't work like that. The benefit of these thermoset plastics is that they usually have much higher melting temperatures. They're also more rigid, but whether that's a benefit or not is up to your application. The fact that they have what's called a high heat deflection, or in simple terms, they can handle a lot of heat at higher pressures, is exactly what we need for plastic injection molding at home. So, as a YouTube channel with some traction, I knew that I could reach out to some 3D printer companies and ask them to send me a good quality resin 3D printer. Now, if you've been following our channel, you know that we've already experienced a bunch of resin 3D printers from companies such as Creality, Frozen, we've even had the Formlabs printer, Elegoo, and these are all great printers. But I did my research and found a printer that I think trumps them all. And that's when I reached out to Haygears to get this awesome barrage of equipment right behind me. Now, full transparency, the first half of this video is going to be a review of the Haygears printer ecosystem, where I'm going to demonstrate the 3D printer, the washing station, and then the curing station. Let's open up the 3D printer itself, and I can start showing you what I mean. So first of all, the actual print bed. This is steel. Most printers that I've played with were always aluminum. Looking in the back, I like that this is ball screw actuated, which is superior to other printers I've used, which just have a lead screw. This printer also seems to have an automatic resin filling system, which will make sure that the tray always has enough resin. Now, the Formlabs that I have also had this system, and I know I like it a lot because in my other printers, they would run out of resin in the middle of the night, and I wouldn't know until I come to an incomplete print the next day. Now, note that these comparisons I'm making are strictly with respect to quality and not about price. If better price is what you're after, it'll be up to you to go and figure out what is within your budget that works best. Next up, we have this wash station, which is also really high quality. When you hold it in your hands, it's very heavy, the rubber feels very thick, and it just feels like it's going to last a very long time. What is unique to me about this one is that it moves the bucket all around instead of having a fan or propeller inside mixing the solution of isopropyl. I'm curious to see how that actually works out. Haygears also has a solution for the isopropyl tanks, which I've never seen before, where you never have to touch the isopropyl itself. That's what these two buckets are here for, and we'll go over that once we're ready to wash our parts. Next, we move up to this super beefy looking curing chamber, which has a lot of the little upgrades here and there, but I don't know 
what my opinion of it is yet until we get to run it. So knowing all that, let's start our project. Hey Gears sent me a bunch of resin as well. What I'm gonna be using for our first print is the PAU-10, and they also have a bunch of other resins, which you can see right here. So let's grab one of these bottles, stick it in the back and start designing. As soon as we do that, we start seeing resin fill up the tank. So while the tank's filling up, I'm gonna turn on the printer. Hey Gears use a closed loop system that prevents us from using third-party slicing software or resins. But there are benefits which they call true UV, L3 printing strategy, algorithms, and hardware as listed on the screen. Once I start the print, you can see that the resin starts seeping in. As the resin seeps in through here, it's going to fill up the tank, and this is our sensor that's going to read the sensor height. I assume once the tray is sufficiently filled, the print's going to start, and we can just come back in a few hours and pick up our parts. All right, so it shows 6 hours, 47 minutes, so I'm going to close this up, and we're going to check in in 7 hours. All right, so the print is done and it actually looks really good. Uh, there's only one way to test the quality, so let's peel these off, throw them in the wash station, go on from there. So this actually peeled off of the supports really easily, probably much easier than any printer that I've ever owned. So I'm not sure what they do that's different, but I really liked that. Um, again, this looks good, so let's take off the other half. All right, well, let's head over to the curing station and set that up. Now, the washing station comes with two tubs, but we really only need one of them to do the initial wash. So I'm going to remove the top one, and we're going to fill up the bottom one with isopropyl alcohol. It takes about three of these one liter isopropyl bottles to fill up this tank. Now I can grab the two dirty sides of our molds and drop them inside. I guess now I just need to cover the tub with the lid. Let's give it a try. So now I'm a little worried because I know that this washing station just juggles this whole tub left and right, and I'm not sure if that's going to vibrate the table like crazy. Only one way to find out, so let's start it up. Uh, it's surprisingly not moving around. This is very vigorous mixing, so I have a feeling that after the three minutes are up, the parts are gonna be very clean. So this method's actually seeming very reliable. Ah, cool. So that actually felt pretty robust. I'm quite impressed. And now to test out the second bucket, which they provide so that we don't have to touch any of the isopropyl. The way it works. Oh, is you gotta close the other chamber. Drop it down put the original on top like so and now to drain the fluid from the top to this second one on the bottom we just turn this knob on the side and then we open up a little hatch at the top sweet now we have our parts all washed inside of here so next up let's throw them in the curing station i guess we just open it up and drop our parts inside as I put these in, I'll mention that the quality of the molds, especially the surface, is much better than any of the other resin printers I've ever used. These feel really good, so let's close them up and head over to Injecto.
All right, so Injecto has reached a set temperature of roughly 225 degrees Celsius. Next, we can grab the blast shield that's included in the Injecto kit, but just so you guys can see better, I'm going to leave that out and instead use my own safety. The first step is to feed some pellets into Injecto or whatever other plastic we decide to use and let it heat up. So let's grab our clamped mole, place it under Injecto, press the button, and then we should have a complete injection. Now there is a little vent hole on the side here, right there. And once plastic comes oozing out of there, we know that the cavity is full, so I can quit trying to fill it. All right, so plastic came oozing out of our vent hole but we also evidently have a leak here on the side. I think that's because the vent hole is far too small, which uh, creates a lot more pressure in the cavity. Now, I could shut the cavity off a little better, so there are two design flaws over here. One, make this hole bigger. Two, maybe add another screw here somewhere. But otherwise, let's open this up and see if this concept works. Okay, well, I've left slots to pry this mold open all around, so I'll stick a screwdriver in, pry it open. And this is what we've got, not terrible. So let me try to pull this out and comes right out. Let's see if we can clean all the flash with a razor blade. And there's our carabiner. It looks pretty good. The actual detail that it picked up from the molds are pretty sweet. So next time I'll probably throw our logo on there. Uh, and the last step is to just push this uh, arm behind uh, here. But I think this APS plastic is a little bit too uh, rigid we need something more flexible and perhaps a design change so instead of changing the molds for the sake of time I'm actually just gonna go ahead and try to use a more flexible plastic with our other molds and then we can compare the two molds and see which type of resin between these two actually holds up better in injections all right so here's our second mold all clamped up I'm hoping that we can see the actual carabiner fill the cavity but for now, I'm gonna face this little hole outward so that we know exactly when our cavity is full and we can stop the injection. There it is, we can see that getting filled up. So I'll give it a second and then I'll lift the injection rim. Now I can pull the mold out and we're just gonna let it cool. All right, a few minutes later, the mold has cooled down, so let's crack it open. Ooh, that looks awesome. Let's see if I can pry it out. There we go, it's not too difficult. Voila, a little bit of flashing, not bad at all. I can trim that with the razor, but uh, otherwise we just push uh, this piece inside. We've got ourselves a carabiner, homemade products. So now I just need to reduce the injection pressure to eliminate this flashing or just close my mold a little tighter, but let me clean this up with a razor blade, make a few more and then see what we've got. So there we have it. I was able to make a bunch of these carabiners at home with a mold that I designed in about 20 minutes, and now I can make as many of these parts as I want, and they're quite functional too. So there's my million dollar product, just kidding. But it does work very well, so let's inspect those molds now and see the difference between the two resins. So again, here are the two resins that we use to make two of the same molds out of different materials. This is the ABS-like resin, and this here is meant for actual high temperature applications. When we take a closer look at the nozzle area for this one, it actually got damaged on the first attempt, while this one here was actually in pretty good shape. You can see that this one maintained uh, it's shaped throughout the entire length, while this one here was pushed down to about half the distance, even though I did double the injections with this mold here. Beyond that, you can see some surface deformities on this resin, which is not meant for these high pressure, high temperature applications, as well as it might be hard to see on camera, but we have some edge distortions here, which are uh, likely due to the heat that we applied on the material. Again, this material has maintained its shape and it's probably going to give me about 100 of these injections. So I'll do a cycle run test to see how many parts I can actually get out of this mold. I have a good feeling about it though. And that's all we have for today. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to check out Injecto at actionbox.ca.